John F. Kennedy. Ladies and gentlemen, the very word secrecy is repugnant in a free and open society. And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. We decided long ago that the dangers of excessive and unwarranted concealment of pertinent facts far outweighed the dangers which are cited to justify it. Even today, there is little value in opposing the threat of a closed society by imitating its arbitrary restrictions. Even today, there is little value in ensuring the survival of our nation if our traditions do not survive with it. And there is very grave danger that an announced need for increased security will be seized upon by those anxious to expand its meaning to the very limits of official censorship and concealment. That I do not intend to permit to the extent that it's in my control. And no official of my administration, whether his rank is high or low, civilian or military, should interpret my words here tonight as an excuse to censor the news, to stifle dissent, to cover up our mistakes, or to withhold from the press and the public the facts they deserve to know. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. No president should fear public scrutiny of his program, for from that scrutiny comes understanding, and from that understanding comes support or opposition, and both are necessary. I am not asking your newspapers to support an administration, but I am asking your help in the tremendous task of informing and alerting the American people. For I have complete confidence. <laughs> in the response and dedication of our citizens, whenever they are fully informed. I not only could not stifle controversy among your readers, I welcome it. This administration intends to be candid about its errors. For as a wise man once said, an error doesn't become a mistake until you refuse to correct it. We intend to accept full responsibility for our errors, and we expect you to point them out when we miss them. Without debate, without criticism, no administration and no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. That is why the Athenian lawmaker Sola decreed it a crime for any citizen to shrink from controversy. And that is why our press was protected by the First Amendment, the only business in America specifically protected by the Constitution, not primarily to amuse and entertain, not to emphasize the trivial and the sentimental, not to simply give the public what it wants, but to inform, to arouse, to reflect, to state our dangers and our opportunities, to indicate our crises and our choices, to lead 
mold, educate, and sometimes even anger public opinion. This means greater coverage and analysis of international news, for it is no longer far away and foreign, but close at hand and local. It means greater attention to improved understanding of the news, as well as improved transmission. And it means, finally, that government at all levels must meet its obligation to provide you with the fullest possible information outside the narrowest limits of national security. And so it is to the printing press, to the recorder of man's deeds, the keeper of his conscience, the courier of his news, that we look for strength and assistance, confident that with your help, man will be what he was born to be, free and independent. You were both in Skull and Bones, the secret society. It's so secret we can't talk about it. What does that mean for America? The conspiracy theorists are going to go wild. I'm sure they are. I don't know. I haven't seen the web. Number 322. <laughs> <laughs> you both were members of Skull and Bones, a secret society at Yale. What does that tell us? Uh, not much, because it's a secret. <laughs> Is there a secret handshake? Is there a secret code? I wish there were something secret I could manifest. 322, a secret number? Uh, there are all kinds of secrets, Tim, but one thing is not a secret. I disagree with this president's... The Shah of Iran was unusually and refreshingly open in our several interviews. When I used a phrase he didn't like, he clearly enjoyed the chance to throw it back at me. As you know, I have been across the Gulf, the Gulf that you call Persian and they call... Arabian. Why do you call, call it Gulf? You have been to school, haven't you? Yes. What, what was the name that you have read during your school days? Persian Gulf. All right. As, <laughs> but they do call it Arabian Gulf. Well, they can do many things. None of the Shah's comments raised hackles like his blast at the American Jewish lobby. Its influence, he claimed, went all the way to the top. Surely, Your Majesty, you're not telling me that the Jewish lobby in the United States pulls the strings of the presidency. Not entirely, but I think even a little too much, even for Israel interests. You think the Jewish lobby in the United States is too powerful for the interests of Israel? I think so. Sometimes they are deserving the interests of Israel because they're, they're pushing around too many people. Well, why would the president of the United States pay attention to that lobby? They are strong. Strong in what sense? They are controlling many things. Controlling what? Newspapers, medias, Your Majesty. Banks, finances, and I'm going to stop there. Well, now wait just a second. You really do believe? that the Jewish community in the United States is that powerful? They make the media reflect their view of foreign policy? Mm -hmm. Yes. They do not report? We do not report honestly? Don't uh, mix things, please. I don't say the media. I say in the media they have people. Not the entire media. Some newspapers will only reflect their, their views, yes. No. The New York Times, for instance is owned by the Salzburger family, who are Jewish. Are you suggesting that the New York Times is biased in its treatment of the question of Zionism, Israel's existence, the United States' relationship with the Arab world? I will have to put all the articles of the New York Times written on this subject and draw the conclusion. You can put this to the computer and it will answer you. What you're saying is that, yes, you do believe. Well, let's wait for the answer of the computer. Washington Post. The same. The networks. Yes. I must say you are speaking with your characteristic candor. Yes, if you like. I try to be candid. I have always been. Uh probably and maybe more because we are going to invest in the UK. Have you been able to assure the British government that you'll be investing much of the money we pay you for your oil in British industry? 
Sure, because I think that our, our country in the next 10 years will be what you are today. In the next 25 years, according to other people, I'm not saying that, will be among the five most prosperous countries of the world. When you become something like that, you start to act accordingly. That is, on a world basis, and uh, obviously without any complexes, and understanding the whole uh, political or geopolitics of the world. The increasing price of oil is going to hit our balance of payments hard and maybe even cause our economy to stop growing altogether for a year or two. Is this really what you want? Just the opposite. That's why what we have decided and the consequent decisions will alleviate for a very good part your balance of payment. And I know that we might eventually do other kind of deal of that sort with other oil producing countries. But don't forget that in three years time you will be a big oil producer yourselves. You might be a member of our club. So uh, the picture is not as bad as uh, it seems to be. Maybe for one year, two years you will have some difficulties. First of all, I'm sure that you will overcome it. I'm sure that you will get out of the present difficult situation. You British have uh, uh, this quality of uh, rallying around the flag, the country when really it starts to be a little uh, uh, dangerous. I'm sure that you will do it. But may, may I put it this way? Many people watching you tonight, watching you talking to us now, uh, many people in Britain, some of them cold, some of them quite poor, will be asking themselves what it is that you and certainly some of your Arab counterparts, sheikhs and rulers and governments, have against them. Are you, uh, does it in any way serve your interests well, why, to, why, to, why? To, to make the British economy suffer? Why, why against? First of all, it's not British economy. If you want to say anything, it sh should be the world economy. And this is not against, we're just defending our chips. Uh, because for such a long time we have just been, uh, well, exploited, I can say that. And uh, why don't you say that when uh, the price of uh, wheat was augmented by 300%, they had something against us. We had to buy it, or soya bean, or steel products, or petrochemical products, which in some cases have augmented by 30 times. So, did you have anything against us when you augmented those prices? Or what I buy from you, even weapons, the price that you are charging today is not what you were charging two months ago. It's increasing. Have you something against us? Have you anything in principle against the system in Britain and other Western countries? Not really against. But I must tell you uh, my opinion. If you continue this way, a permissive, undisciplined society, you are going to blow up. And uh, in matter of fact... How do you mean blow up? I'm not quite clear what you mean by that. Well, you will go bankrupt. Uh, you work not enough. You try to get too much money for the little work that you are putting up. And this cannot continue. It can continue for a few months, maybe one or two years but not forever. You're not going to help us not to go bankrupt if you put the rise of oil in here. I won't be a good friend of yours if I did help you uh, being uh, uh, not aware of the seriousness of the situation. Do you then see oil as in some way a weapon that can correct us and our system? Not really, but uh, I was trying to defend my own interests. But I think at the same time it is serving this cause to, to maybe uh, have the effect of a shock on you and to realize and uh, wipe your eyes and see that, well, to face the future you will have to change your ways. How particularly would you like us to change? Discipline, more work. Do you see any conflict between the social and economic demands of your people? About 50% of them can't read or write yet. And the amount you spend on weapons? No, because we couldn't spend more either on illiteracy or other social things 
because first of all we wouldn't have the teachers and then for instance you know, over hospitals wouldn't have the doctors the trained nurses and it could create inflation too can I say that this year we are going to have <coughs> a 40 percent national growth at constant prices which is more than twice or almost three times the world record which was held by the Japanese. Do you think as your country gets more prosperous you'll be able to restrain the demands of your people for more of the kind of democracy we have in Britain? But who says that my people are demanding the democracy that you have in Britain? Don't you think that history indicates that that does come with growing prosperity? Are there any, are there any developed not powerful countries in this world with hereditary monarchies like your own? Well, yes, but not necessarily, because uh, our tradition, are on just on the opposite way, the people and their king are so close that they feel uh, as the member of the same family. They have, I think, the respect that at least families or children used to have for their father. ما در موضوع نفت با شرکت های عامل یعنی کنسترسیوم نفتی که در ایران کار می کند چون شاید پنشی شرکت دیگری هست که با ما کار می کند ولی البته اونها در یک محدوده بسیار کوچکتری هست مشغول مذاکره بودیم مذاکرات نه قطع شده است و نه به جایی است این است که امروز بدون ورود در جزیات خطوط کلی آن را باید برای شما بدونید موقعی که در 1954 ما قرارداد نفتی را امضا کردیم که شاید در اون روز بیشتر از اون هم نمی توانستیم به دست بیاوریم یکی از مواد قرارداد این بود که شرکت های عامل منافع ایران را به بهترین وقتی حفظ خواهم کرد ما دلایلی داریم که این کار نشده است در قرارداد پنجا و چهار سه دوره تمدید پنج ساله در نظر گرفته بودند که زمین شرط شده بود که منافع ایران حفظ بشود ما دلایل کافی داریم که مطابق حتی همین قرارداد پنجا و شهار قرارداد نفت خود را با کنسرسیون در سال 1979 یعنی شش سال دیگر دیگر به هیچ وجه تمدید نکنید حقوق حاکمیت هر مملکتی به او اجازه می دهد که بر ثروت طبیعی خود نظارت کامل داشته باشد و اصول منشور ملل متحد و قطنامه های بخصوصی در این مورد تصدیق دارد که نه فقط ثروت هر مملکتی ثروت زیر زمینی و روی زمینی هر مملکتی مال اوست ولی حتی قراردات هایی که با کمپانی های خارجی برای بحر برداری و استخراج بسته می شود نمی تواند بدون سوادید مملکت صاحب ثروت مورد بحر برداری قرار بگید یک امکان این است که تا 1979 یعنی شش سال دیگه کمپانی های موجود به کارشون ادامه بدهند به شرطی که در آمد هر بسکه نفتی که به ما می رسد از درآمد ممالک هم حوزه ما کمتر نباشد به شرطی که قدرت صادراتی ایران به 8 میلیون بشکه در روز برسد و اگر فاصله ای که حالا تا اون رقم هست پر نشود خود ما خواهیم کرد و خود ما میدانیم با اون نفت اضافی چه بکنیم در 1979 قرارداد خاتمه پیدا خواهد کرد و شرکت های فعلی 
در اون ردیف بلندی که بعد خواهد ایستاد و مشتری نفت ایران خواهد بود بدون هیچ مزایایی مثل دیگری باید بیان سخت بکشن یا اینکه از موقع امضای قرارداد جدیدی تمام مسئولیت ها و هرچی که امروز در دست ما نیست تمام برگردد به ایران و شرکت های عامل فعلی مشتری قویر مدت ما باشند و ما نفت را به اونها برای مدت طولانی به قیمت خوب با تخصیصی که هر کسی به یک مشتری خوبی میدهد خواهیم فروخت و این تنها راه این است که اون بداند که تا هر موقع که قرار داد طول میکشد 20 سال 25 سال نفت به اون میرسد در صورتی که در اون مرحله دیگری را من اینقدر مطمئن نیستم که اون نفتا به همین سادگی به خارج از هر منبیکتی ساله بشود این مطلب باید به دودی برای ما روشن بشود شفت اول ادامه تا تا هفت نه یا مشتری شدن و مطمئن بودن به این که نفت برای مدت طولانی با شرایط مناسب در اختیار خواهد ولی برای این که شرط دوم را ما بتوانیم انجام بدهیم لازم است به خصوص که سنت ما توسعه پیدا می کند بهترین متخصصین خارجی را یا به طور دست جمعی و متشکل یا به طور انفرادی در استخدام خود بیاورد برای ما کار بکنند و در حفظ و نگهداری و تفخص و تجسس بیش از گذشته دقت بکنیم و بیش از همیشه برای این که یک صنعت درجه یک مقیاس بین المللی ایجاد بکنیم خواهیم کشید و برای این کار از فردا هست باید مطالعه کنیم که سازمان شرکت ملی نفت ایران چطور خودش را برای یک زمان فوری و یا برای سال 79 آماده و مهیا کنم ما خودمون بهتر از هر کسی نواقص خودمون را میدانیم عمده نفت ما این است که کارهای فنی به اندازه کافی نداریم مدارس هرسی به اندازه کافی نداریم و متاسفانه موقعی که مدرسه هرسی درست میکنیم بعد از چند سالی فورا به تقاضای این و آن اون مدرسه هرسی که باید دیپلمه هرسی بده بیرون فورا میخواد یک برچسب دانشگاهی به سر خودش بزنه فورا یک ورقه لیسانس آقا بعد میره پشت میز میشه کارگر فرستادین به آلمان فدرال برای یاد گرفتن هرسی برگشته به ایران البته چند نفر از اونها فورا برگشتن سر کار اولیش یه دی میگن خیر ما دیگه پشت ماشین نمیست این عیده ها کارگرانی که یا زنهای شما یا خواهرهای شما در کارخانه نصف شما کار میکنن مگر اغلب و اکثریت دستجات مذهبی که در روزهای عزاداری در این شهر را میفتن مگر از صبح تشکیل نمی شود اسلام همونطوری که گفتم اسلام روز اول است و این کاری که ما می کنیم و این مواد انقلاب ایران تمام استوار بر همه رسول است مذهب اسلامی که پیغمبر آورد نه اون چیزی که به آن اضافه کردند و از آن برای خود و استفاده خود دکان ساختن Well, not only that, Yazdi was an American citizen, Qut Zadeh was thrown out of Georgetown University because he was incapable of studying. And many people say that first he was a CIA agent and then a KGB agent. So that you think that it's possible that 
Khomeini had some form of Western support in those last few months at least. Well, obviously, how come that all these elements come together at the same time? When was the first time that anybody mentioned to you the possibility of taking a holiday, going abroad, leaving the country, going into exile? That suggestion of leaving the country may be seen to some as a solution. And they were so wishful thinkers that they thought that if I went away, everything would stay the same, there will be a transition, they will have a beautiful democracy, and this and that. This is the more optimistic approach that I can have to the problem. Because I just cannot believe that those people who were suggesting that were hoping that my country will fall to pieces, as it has. Was there a time when you privately said to yourself, um, I may have to leave? before anyone suggested it to you, I may not win this battle? <coughs> well, maybe not exactly in this uh, concept, but uh, I had many sleepless, sleepless nights just wondering what is happening, because I still do not understand what has happened. Question, what is going on? But uh, it was not uh, so much the question that I was thinking that it was time to go. I was uh, rather thinking that uh, you know, like an end to something. Without thinking of going, you were thinking, maybe this is the end of an era. Or something. Of me, of an era, or, or of something. Is there anything that uh, the United States or Britain could have positively done that you would have regarded as assistance? <clears throat> Not in the end, no. Not in the end. Not after? Not after the, maybe uh, two or three months, uh, the first two or three months of 1978. Up until then, what could they have done? Assess the situation and stop giving advice. The advice was not helpful. It was confusing, you mean? Well, the results are here, unless uh, the world is satisfied with what is going on in Iran. So then the advice were wonderful. Next up, the Shah suggests that his fundamentalist enemies are untrue to their faith. All of your past experience of the danger of communism 